Thank you for listening to the Mental Health Survival Guide on North Volume Network. All right, so we are here at the Mental Health Survival Guide, and today is a special day because we are going to talk about surviving college, the school experience that is mostly elective for most adults here in America. And I've got some great guests here today, but before I introduce them, I would like to take some time and say, have you had the time to go to North Volume Media's Facebook page? Because that is a great introduction to find some awesome podcasts and other amazing things that are available from North Volume. So North Volume Media, you can also download the app on your Apple or your uh, what is it called? Android, Android device. So, so I'm Nick, and this is the Mental Health Survival Guide. So we're gonna start. Um, my guests today are Jordan. Jordan, uh, I'm business administration major right now. Uh, I'm gonna pick up another major. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do yet. Something along the business field, but uh, my interests obviously are something with business. Great. I'm Mac. I'm a psychology major, and my field of interest is working in counseling with incarcerated persons. Oh, awesome. We're going to be good friends. I'm Aaron. I'm not quite as interesting as my students alongside me. I work at SUNY Plattsburgh in a whole variety of different roles, focusing on diversity and social justice education. Wow. You're using your radio voice, Aaron. Yes, I, like I am. <laughs> okay. So Aaron's been on the show before. Um, and so if you're not used to the show, we talk about uh, mental health and we talk about survival. And the key concept to that is that uh, surviving is so much more than just having your basic needs met. So we good with that? So I've got some questions for you and feel free to jump in when you feel comfortable to answer or if you're feeling less uncomfortable to answer. <laughs> so quickly... Let's jump right into this. Why did you go to school? Why did you go to college? I definitely went to college for uh, to get an education, of course, but um, and get my degree. But uh, definitely for the experience to make lifelong friends, and obviously to grow, uh, to learn how to like be on my own and to make the right choices and to do well in college and be happy in college and do everything that's right. So how did you know going to college was going to instill that into you? Uh, well, definitely I wanted, I, I always like wanted to go to college when I was younger. I always like loved home, loved family, but always wanted to like go away to college and like have like experience of being on my own. And um, I, I knew it was going to be like difficult because I love being with my family. I feel safe and I feel that being home is just like, there's nothing better than it. But I also felt like it was a, big like it would be a big learning experience for me to like go away and just like really like kind of get out there in the world and meet different types of people so oh great so where's home oh long island long island yeah. oh i could i can tell <laughs> good job good job uh aaron mac i wanted to go to college it was always my dream to go to college really just because i love being in this kind of learning environment and also the necessity of getting a degree to actually do what i want to do but I really just love to be in a classroom, and I think college has really offered a lot of personal growth as far as leadership as well, which is important to what I want to do. Okay, great. Mr. Aaron, you got any insight on why you wanted to go to college? Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Okay. Um, but also, everyone in my family holds a, uh, not necessarily terminal degree, but a higher degree. So okay. So I was sort of encouraged to go into that socioeconomic class by my family, I guess, is the most appropriate way to characterize that. All right. So uh, the three of you gradu are, are students or gra have graduated from Plats SUNY Plattsburgh, so as also my alma mater as well. Why SUNY Plattsburgh? I uh, definitely was going to stay in state uh, financially. That, like, worked best for oh, me. Oh, yeah. Yep. So uh, I was looking actually at SUNY... Oneonta, SUNY Plattsburgh, obviously, and SUNY Cortland. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to, when I visited all the schools, I knew a few people at each, so I got a good experience of each. But ultimately, uh, I get extended time, and uh, I get, like, I have a learning disability. So uh, they definitely helped, like, a lot with that. Like, I think uh, 
the school has great support uh support cast yeah and it does. Yep. they definitely offer that the most and it wasn't only about like going to like maybe the most fun school or it was more about like education and see like where i think i would succeed most okay so just suny plattsburgh fit the bill definitely. okay how about you mac I actually didn't have a good reason for going to SUNY Plattsburgh. I picked the school farthest away on the map. So I think it's really important um, when talking about college to make sure you do your research. I'm happy with my choice, but I think it could have gone a lot of different ways just because I didn't visit and I just said, yep, that's far enough away and it's cold, so I'll be there. (laughs) Wow. So you know what? I appreciate that honesty because I actually feel like a lot of people do that. And wow, that's that's how about you, Aaron? My answer is actually a combination of their answers. Yeah. Um, I also have a learning disability, and I was trying to get out from under the shadow of my elder brother. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, He Great. and I went to many of the same schools together, so I was always Danny's little brother. And then I did not want that to follow me into college as much as I love and adore my older brother. No, and now you're Aaron, and you got a lot of little brothers out there. <laughs> Metaphorically. Metaphorically, Yeah. yes. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so... N- Neither of you considered job or vocational training out of high school? No? What about the military? No? No? Okay, that's good. That's fine. Um, So, important question. Have you seen the college humor skit, SUNY Plattsburgh versus Hogwarts? I have not. Okay, well. I have not either. I'm not going to, to ruin anything for you, but... A uh, student, it's just about a student who gets accepted to two colleges, one being SUNY Plattsburgh and the other being Hogwarts. So if you have if you have any time, which students don't have a ton of time, but if you have any time, Google it. It's fantastic. So uh, just to share some information, I got a bunch of it. Uh, let me know how you're feeling about these information. So according to Princeton University, apparently that's a college out there somewhere. And uh, their three, or the most co- three common pl- um, majors are uh, political science, communication, and computer science. Does that make sense? Right? All seems like job-oriented, except for political science. What do you do with a political science degree? You become a lawyer. Oh, okay. That <laughs> makes that makes sense, I guess. Sure. Um, but according to U- USA, usnews.com, uh, which is the only place that I could get good statistics on SUNY Plattsburgh, which is alarming to me. Um, the most popular SUNY Plattsburgh majors in the past five years are uh, communication, psychology, and marketing. So, you know, and communications kind of has that business, business aspect. So what was, what was your um, focus when you came to SUNY Plattsburgh, Aaron? Uh, when I first came to SUNY Plattsburgh, I was focusing on psychology because I wanted to be a mental health counselor and make tons of money because I was very misguided and misinformed. Right, because mental health counselors make so much money. Right. Yep. Uh, That very quickly changed to a focus on anthropology, which is what I was actually interested in, which is different cultural aspects and people, why they do things, that sort of thing. That's great. That's great. So what do you feel about those majors? So these majors are the most popular majors, um, and... As far as I was able to tell, a lot of people do actually graduate with these majors. So when you graduate with your major, do you expect to have a job right afterwards? I'm personally going towards graduate school and trying to obtain a doctoral degree. So I know after this, there will be more schooling. But after my master's program, I should be able to get into the job market because the area that I'm looking for is very much needed. Yeah, So definitely, definitely. So business. Yeah, um, I'm trying to get my MBA degree, so I would be taking a fifth year, and I'm not sure if I would be taking that at Plattsburgh or where I would go, but I just feel like if I work hard in school, I feel like that I'll definitely be able to have a job right out of college. Yeah, and there's, you know, the MBA degree is also, um, it's quite versatile. It's not just, you know, working uh, in a hotel or another business industry. You can actually work for -for not-for-profits. Um, and manage uh, political and, and state-run uh, situations. So uh, MBA, it's very versatile. So good for you. It sounds like you did a little bit of research. Um, so I'm going to ask you, here's another weird question, throwing it out there. What are some shocking things that you learned while you've been a student that you wish you had known before? 
I should have started preparing my meals on my own when I was at home, not always just ordering food or making something very easy, like in the oven or pasta or something. I wish I honestly learned how to cook because then I would be just eating so much better at school. I think the school gets uh, repetitive. Uh, I mean, the food here gets repetitive. Right. And uh, I definitely, like, if lear- if I learned how to cook, like, right off the bat, I-, I would be eating everything that I would want right away. And also, I feel like I would save more money. But um, also, a lot of time on your hands. Yeah. So, like, that that's, like, what are you going to do with your time? Are you going to wake up? If you work out, are you going to work out at night? Are you going to work out in the morning? How, are you going to start your day early? Are you going to sleep in? Are you going to wake up and go straight to the library? Like, and balancing your time of, like, eating and just being, uh, exercising, being healthy, and also balancing your weekends with uh, your friends when you want to go out and party. Like, do you, ha- do you have a big test on Friday? Should you be going out on a Thursday night? Do you have a big test on Monday? Should right. you... And just like, just really just realizing that you have so much time on your hands and everything's capable as long as you make the right decisions. So do you think that if somebody came to your high school and was like, hey, we're going to do a workshop, I'm going to tell you what the day in the life of a college student is like, that would have been something you would have been interested in? Yeah. You think that would have helped you? Yeah. Okay. What have you learned, Max, since you've been in school? Um, I agree with Jordan about time management. I think going to college really helps you develop those skills because there's a lot of things that you can do with your day. And I think the workload is really not as large as I expected it to be. As long as you don't procrastinate and you do a little bit here and there, it can really be productive. Right. I'm I'm actually the um, lord and ruler of the world of procrastination. And uh, it's how I work, though. So I'm, I'm a big fan of the two types of stress, which are distress and eustress. And eustress really drives me. But um, I mean, and I had a pretty good GPA when I attended Plattsburgh State. But I rarely ever studied, except for like right before a test. And I rarely did my homework except for right before it was due. Sometimes if I knew I could like get by with a little bit of extra credit, I, I would do that. I'm not in school right now, so I can I can tell you that. But what I will, but what I will say is like the procrastination thing. How do you get into? How do how do you fall into a routine where you're not procrastinating? Because sometimes signs of procrastinating are signs of depression, which are really a, a, that depression really affects students. So how do you how do you motivate yourself to not procrastinate? I think it starts with being aware, like you said, that those are some signs of a mental disorder or maybe just a problem existing within the person. So if you're not doing the things that you normally do and you're not motivated the way you are ordinarily, if you're aware of that, it's easier to get help. But also um, speaking to that as well, I think you should be aware of the resources on campus as well as tutoring and also just mental health in general. Okay. All right. Aaron, anything you'd like to have known before you went to college? The other day is winning Mega Millions numbers, probably. Okay, Um, there you go. But on a more serious note, I wish I had been much better at time management. I know that if I'd formulated a stricter regimen for myself to operate within that, much as Mac and Jordan described, it would have been much easier to not procrastinate. It would have been easier to fulfill all of my obligations and make sure that I was able to be even more involved on campus than I was. Okay, cool. So so there are programs that are out there. Um, there are some that are hosted in the summertime at Plattsburgh State. What is that called? Um, where the high school students Upward go? Bound. Upward Bound, right. So uh, none of you participated in any of those programs, right? No. no. It's not available everywhere either. So, but maybe that is something that should be um, available in even a smaller scale because an after an afternoon you could probably learn a lot of this information right ahead of time. You think your do you think your experiences are uh, unique or do you think a lot of students 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 uh, experience these time management need for time management? I think definitely every student has to deal with time management. How could you not? Um, Especially like uh, there's athletes, there's student athletes, there's students who take positions in school. And then the more you want to do, the more time that's going to take up and be occupied. And then that leaves less time for you to do your work. So 
uh, whenever you have free time, sometimes that could not motivate someone to go right and do their work because they wanna. They're always at class. They're on a sports team. So then when they have like time to like hang out, they're not just doing their work. So I think time management affects everyone because like you can't just you whenever you have the chance to get things done, like you should be taking advantage of it and not just like wasting all your time just having fun in college. You know. That's good advice. I don't know how easy it is to follow, but that's good advice. <laughs> so um, I'm a big fan of the Huffington Post, actually, you know, even though it's a lot of fluff, but sometimes there's some really good resources out there. And uh, something, if you've ever heard any of our past episodes, something that we do on a regular occasion is we'll talk about advice and then we'll discuss whether we actually think it's good or bad advice. So I'm going to give you, this is a top 10 list that was on Huffington Post a couple years ago, and it's 10 things kids must know before going to college. And I'm just going to throw them out there. And if you think that is good advice, say yay. If you think it's not good advice, say boo or whatever, okay? So uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And the idea behind that is that you have all this freedom and opportunity, and it can be overwhelming, but you've got to buckle down, right? What do you think of that? Is that good advice? I agree with that. I think it's really important to keep track of what you're doing and make sure that you're staying on that schedule like Aaron was talking about. But I also think it's really important to de-stress and take time for catharsis as well because it kind of, you can fall on one end of the spectrum a lot of the time. You can either be too involved in everything that you're doing and not have any free time, mm. or you can just be very lax and not focused at all with your schoolwork. Right. So, and, and so a common trope is that, you know, students, they leave high school and they go off to college and that's like the first time that they've had experiences being an adult, Right. And that kind of freedom can make or break a student, right? So what would you suggest if somebody is like just experienced this overwhelming freedom, how would you, you know, rein them in? I think definitely for me, like right when I got to school, like my brother, my dad was always calling me, my sister, just to like make sure because they knew like college with me honestly was a make or break because like I... They knew I played sports and in high school, and I always liked hanging out with my friends. Mm -hmm. And I got my stuff, I took care of my stuff in high school, but they knew that like I was gonna be on my own in college. So I feel like them just always checking up on me and kind of bugging me. Like at times I might have thought it was annoying, but like it's honestly like them just really just wanting the best for me. So that's great for me. That was like definitely the only like that was like a great checkup for me. Right. So you would encourage parents and loved ones. To, even if they feel like they might be annoying their loved ones to still check in with them regularly and check up on them. Definitely. That's good. That's good. Here, number two. So um, you mind if we no, go? go ahead. So I think it's important to recommend to folks that whenever given the possibility to try something new, that they embrace that. Right. Um, I think one of the most peculiar sort of tendencies we find these days is that folks prefer to stay in their comfort zone and are afraid to well, sure. deviate from that. Yeah. And so... I think it's important not just in college, but in any facet or any developmental aspect point of one's life to lean into the things that scare them, to lean into the things that they're not experienced with and to become more comfortable being uncomfortable, if that I'm makes sure. sense. Yeah, like doing podcasts. Precisely. So. Definitely. Good. All right. <laughs> so um, here's another point they had. Um, everybody doesn't have your best interests at heart. And it's kind of warning and foretelling that there are predators out there who people to use you and are just not necessarily treat you nice. Do you think that's good advice to tell someone before they hit college? I think yes. And that kind of goes along with picking the right group of people to surround yourself with. Because I know my freshman year, I was surrounded by people who I realized after being around them that they weren't within the same kind of mindset that I was and they right. weren't really trying to really achieve things in college. Mm -hmm. So I think it's easy to fall into what's comfortable and be accepted among your peers, but I think you should try to look for a group of people who support what you want to do and are also going to motivate you as well. Well, good. Um, so like, would you suggest uh, fraternity or sorority? I don't really have um, enough knowledge about really fraternities or sororities, but from experiences that my friends have told me, it has been a good support system, but there's also a lot of 
temptations within that as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. When I went to college and I graduated in 2004, so um, the the fraternities and sorority situation was a little more intense, it seems. Uh, and there was there was a lot more negative aspects to it. So I actually found a peer group by joining and doing theater. You know, that really worked for me. Um, but hey, here's another point. Be your own food police. We were kind of talking about that, Jordan, right? Right? <laughs> you got to be your own food police. You got to kind of do your research and do you agree? That's good advice? Yeah, no, for sure. Okay. All right. All right. Here's a couple more. If you calculate what each class costs, you'll be less likely to skip class. And that is so much more true than it was when this uh, top 10 list came out. <laughs> College is expensive. Mm-hmm. And even if you're getting uh, financial aid or even a full ride, if you put a cost value to something, right, it makes it seem more valuable, correct? Mm-hmm. However, I'm going to devil's advocate on this right here. Do it. Students, uh, you have a overwhelming like amount of stimulation thrown at you. Every time you take a, a class, even if it's not in your field of interest, your teacher is expecting you to take that seriously and to understand everything. That kind of pressure is huge. And if you are feeling stressed out and if you are feeling... Uh, overwhelmed by that, then taking one day off is not the worst thing. But I do suggest that if you take more than just one day off, uh, maybe go down to the health center and and talk to a uh, you know advisor counselor there. Uh, I actually suffered from what I didn't even know in 2003 was fatigue syndrome, and I <laughs> I just thought that was another term for being really tired but it's actually a little more than that. I was overwhelmed. So so I, I'm just throwing it out there. But do you ever factor in the cost of your school? Do you ever factor in the idea? So you're going to go for your doctorate, Mac. Mm-hmm. So that's going to have a that's gonna have a financial aspect to it. How yes. do you feel about that? Absolutely. I think um, speaking to that, one of the biggest stressors in college is actually the cost, especially if you're not receiving a lot of financial aid or if your parents can't really afford it. So knowing the cost of classes definitely does kind of inspire me to take it a bit more seriously, but I also agree with the point that if you need a day and you want to take that day, then maybe some teachers should be more accommodating of that. Yeah, yeah. I actually had a teacher that I missed one class, but uh, we didn't agree very, very often. Uh, We kind of butted heads. I had one class where I missed one um, thing and she had a, a test and it was and I didn't it wasn't scheduled and um, she actually it brought my grade down a whole letter <laughs> and uh, I had to I had to petition there was a whole process involved so um, yeah sometimes sometimes you have to fight for you know your, yourself you have to advocate for yourself uh, work first pay, play later you think that's good advice work first play later right definitely good advice 100%. yeah percent yeah I would say that's like great advice because if you just get everything done during the day then you have your whole night to relax and choose what you want to do without worrying about something on your shoulders if you choose to play first then you might not even get all your work done or you might not be right you know like if you're just hanging out with your friends all day just relax and well it's incentive too right Mm -hmm. it's a it's kind of it's a reward system which is very big in the whole recovery mental health right so you do something because you're going to it's the simplest kind of hey this equals this and you get this this is a prize afterwards right um when does that not work for you though when does the whole work first play later not work for you because here's the thing it's not like all of your assignments are due at the same time right so you make social engagements with your friends and you are going to go out, you you have these expectations, and your social expectations are sometimes just as important as your education as far as, you know, building connections with your with your peers. So how do you make that choice to choose, do I go out with my friends or do I stay home and, and read through these chapters that I'm a week behind in? I mean, it's not there's not an answer, but I don't know if you had any insight on that. I think there actually might be an answer. Yeah. Um, a big misconception is that folks are going through the educational process to retain particular information, and I don't think that should really be 
the point of an education, right. certainly not higher education. Right. Oh, yeah. It should be more of a focus on how to develop certain thought processes that are most effective for what it is that comes next, because the most successful student mo- won't necessarily become the most successful professional. Right. I agree that that's an aspect of that needs to be involved in the education reform, but but I, I also do feel like there are teachers out there who want you to memorize the birthday of the person who supplied the weapons to the person who tried to assassinate a certain Venezuelan president. You know, it's I, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Not by too much. Though. No, but there are there are things that, that I've I've been like so I took when I took statistics. In college, I didn't realize, oh my gosh, I love statistics. This is so much fun. It's like playing a game, you know, playing the rules. I I really fell in love with statistics. But when I took my um, Asian studies, which I just took because I thought it looked interesting, I loved every aspect of it, but I knew that there was not a lot that I was learning that was going to apply to my life at the time. So, or even still yet, but hey, someday. Well, I think that's the real challenge of an educator, to take material that may not necessarily be something that comes off as directly interesting and being able to turn that into something that people lean into. I know that right. I had a lot of trouble with statistics, but I took quantitative mathematics, and can I say the faculty member's name? It's Absolutely, yeah. This guy, Justin Wampler, was teaching the course, and one of the questions on the final exam was how many jurors of salsa would it take to cover the entire field of the Pittsburgh Steelers? Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Okay. And do I remember the answer? No. In fact, I'm pretty sure I got the question wrong. Sorry. But you, but you were, in, but the the method somehow left an impression. Exactly. Right. And the approach of making it so that this complex mathematical formula is something that isn't just an abstract concept; it's something that you could use practically. Right. Right. Huh. Okay. Good. That's good. So, uh, one the last bit of advice that I just want to kind of throw out there that was on this Huffington Post article is call home. Do you feel like that's advice that you need to be reminded? Call home. Hmm? Uh, For me, my mom has always been my support system, so I didn't really need a reminder to call her every day, but I think a lot of people could use that support from whoever is supporting them and giving them that help with with everything in college. So I think it's important to stay in touch with the people that are your support system, but also not to become too dependent on that. Yeah. Because a lot of people, um, while they're experiencing homesickness, will just constantly be in touch with whoever that person is, and it can be a little bit counterproductive, I think. Right. Performing, you're actually building a crutch to people that aren't even around you when you should possibly be searching for connections with the people who are immediately around you, right? Um, and, and I guess that is the appeal for, um, you know, social groups like fraternities and sororities, I, I guess. But for me, it wasn't. But Aaron, you, you, you're part of a fraternity, weren't you? I was indeed, as is Jordan currently. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. And it works for you, right? Yeah. You have people sure. that motivate you and people that, you know, encourage you and support you. And that's a wonderful thing. That's mm-hmm. definitely a wonderful thing. Um, but I will, you know, just throwing this out there, it's, it probably works best for you because of the work that certain people like Aaron has done to try to, uh, reshape the Greek life landscape. So, so thank you, Aaron, for doing that. Thank you, I think. Oh, stop. Yep. Okay. So, so here I'm going to throw out some statistics. School is, well, you know, this isn't a statistic, but I'm just going to throw this out there. It's hard. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Right? It's not It's not something that just comes easy to you, because if it was, then it'd either be way more expensive or everyone would be doing it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but here are some statistics that I think really kind of affect the uh, higher education landscape. Um, this is from classesandcareers.com. They just they found uh, some uh, resource data. Uh, I couldn't find how they formulated it, but the stats are pretty neat, so I just thought I'd ask you about them. Uh, so average number, and this is as of uh, 2017, so average number of American college dropouts a year are 1,125,000. What? <laughs> oh my American. So, so students drop out <clears throat> per year. That's an average number. Could, that's pretty. What do you think about that? Do you think that's likely? 
that's a really high number, but it's also not surprising because I've known just within my own group of people, I've known at least 10 people and I'm only a sophomore who have dropped out either due to things like stress or financial inability. So I think it's really important to recognize that statistic and also think about how we can make the college experience better. Right. To me, a number like that says um, there are people going to college for the wrong reasons, right? That's probably a, a general part of that. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. that also, oh, sorry. I feel like that also speaks to the increasingly predatory nature of higher ed. Oh, um, yeah. One of the problems is that as the birth rate around the United States and elsewhere goes down, um, you find schools fighting for more and more students, and or fewer and fewer students, I should say. And they still need to bring students in to help support their institutions financially to make sure that they're able to continue onward. And one of the big problems is that some institutions are inviting students to attend their schools, and those students aren't prepared for the rigors of higher education. Right. And the schools aren't necessarily doing enough to help prepare them or bring them up to speed. Mm-hmm. One of the things that you mentioned earlier is that... Um, there are vocational training programs. There are community colleges. There are a lot of different institutions and innovative ways that folks can go out and get really well-paying jobs, right. ones that can really meaningfully help them contribute to society. Yeah. But there is this peculiar elitism around college, and especially four-year colleges. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in my in my generation, it was it was very much a if you didn't go to college and you went to job training, you were less. You were less than. It, there's that, you know, but it's really funny because I know I know a lot of uh, vocationally trained and job trained individuals who make way more than my fellow college graduates do. Um, so it's it's just a really strange thing. I have a master's degree, and I also have friends who went through vocational training that make many times yeah, what I currently yeah. make. Plumbers, right? Oh yeah, they make great money. And thank goodness for so, them. Yeah. <laughs> That's a job I don't want to do. Um, okay, so average number of this is another depressing statistic. Average number of college student bankruptcy bankruptcies each year is nine thousand three hundred. So bankruptcies that are declared from college debt, that's ridiculous, right? But do we feel like it's it's understandable? College is expensive. It's only getting more expensive, right? It's also a big in big part, I think, due to the exclusivity of the higher educational setting. I mean, as we continue to defund public educational systems, one of the things we find is that college becomes increasingly important if you want to be able to compete in a workplace. Right. Um, not just to acquire jobs, but to be able to hold on to them, ensuring that this, you have the skill sets to do that may require a higher education or community college or what have you, because it's a pay-to-play system now. Right. And with Sally Mae and other financial institutions offering loans to almost anybody. Right. With astonishingly high rates of interest sometimes. Yes. Yeah. It should be illegal. It absolutely should be illegal. <laughs> I'm surprised, though, uh, that it was honestly only 9,000, though, because I actually thought the number might actually be Way a higher. little bit higher so, than that. So the number of defaults are was like something along the million line. But this is these are just bankruptcies. So okay. these are several procedures where a person has had to declare bankruptcy in order to not in order to defer their college loan. That's I don't know. I just saw that and I, I got slightly angry. So I thought that should be something we uh, talk about. Well, here's another one: average college students debt after college twenty three thousand seven hundred dollars. That sounds like a big number, but it's really not because the to to enroll and go to some of these college to some colleges for a year is more than that. So something's working, right? This is an average, by the way. So this means that in the spectrum of all things, there are people who owe very little to nothing and people who owe way a lot more, uh, especially probably those who are attempting to get their doctorate, right? Yeah, absolutely. It'll be worth it, though. Don't, don't think about the money. Well, that's an interesting thing that you said there. Because right. I think that what's fascinating is I've met a lot of people who have astonishing intellects and incredible, you know, just levels of intelligence and capacities to engage with a whole variety of different positions and career paths and really right. contribute meaningfully to entire fields. But because they haven't gotten those letters after their name, they're prevented and the door shuts in their face. Yeah. And so very much it's becoming a pay-to-play system because, look, inevitably what that means is that the fo- folks who can pay for all of these educational degrees, which lead up to and sometimes include PhD, 
I mean, these aren't necessarily the best of the best. These are just the best of those who can afford right. to yeah. participate. Yeah, I mean, you can still get your doctorate and have pretty terrible grades. You just have to graduate, right? And yeah. I know that's a oversimplification, but no, you're right. It's 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 definitely a sign of privilege probably a little bit but there are people out there who i do know that have worked really hard to get their doctorate and but those are the people that i want to know but a plaque on the wall doesn't tell me anything right but but it looks cool right <laughs> and and here is the most depressing statistic out of uh all of classes and career.com the most common dri uh driven car uh, by a college student is the Toyota Yaris. So, really? Yeah, yeah. Which was actually my car. I used to have that car, and I, I freaking <laughs> love that car. It was a great car. Just too small. So You can still hear it driving by some days. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, it actually got sold to somebody who lives like right next to me. So, But what, do you, what, do you, what, do you, what cars do you drive? Do you drive cars? I actually sold my car to help pay for college. Woo! So I guess that kind of goes hand Man, in hand with that statistic. dedication <laughs> right there. Cool. Great. Um, now, uh, I, are, do both of you live on campus? Yeah. Do you find that to be a better situation? No. Uh, no? <laughs> Absolutely not. No, please tell me why. Um, well, there are many reasons. I think not only is it extremely expensive to live on campus, and you can definitely find cheaper alternatives outside of campus, or at least right. my friends have, but also just seeking help and kind of that sense of community that's supposed to be there isn't really always there with dorms. I don't think the schools really do as much as they could. Certain buildings, I would say, with making those who live on campus feel more included and giving them more resources. That's okay. just my personal experience. And also just the cleanliness of living on the campus dorms is a big factor as well. You think it's 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 low? Oh yes, absolutely. Okay. Wow. Wow, it's good it's good to hear. That's good to hear. What about you? Yeah. Do, do you enjoy your experience living on campus, Jordan? I mean, uh, I do and I don't. Uh, like last year I lived in a different dorm and I moved to a better dorm. But I just realized that after this year that I definitely wouldn't want to live on campus. Uh, some of the same exact reasons, but mainly like cheaper alternatives. Like right. it's just so expensive to live on the dorms, to live in the dorms. And I don't know, also like privacy. Like I, I would rather have a single as my room personally. Wow. And I would just rather just be like with a group, a group of friends in a house than just be in a dorm. Do you think uh, both of you are going to move off campus before your graduation? Definitely. I'm planning on moving off campus next year. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. What about you, Mac? Um, I have two friends who actually live off campus at the moment, and I spend a majority of my time sleeping there. So oh, okay. I think that's a big aspect as well, that sleep is really important, and sharing a room with someone who has an opposite sleep schedule as you can be really difficult. Ooh, You're yeah. waking up constantly, mm -hmm. so that's another huge aspect. Definitely. I want to go back to your cleanliness comment. Um, so when I was living on campus as a student, I was actually staying in Whiteface Hall, uh, which is one of the high rises. And uh, this was so in 2002, there was this group of ruffians who would go around uh, defacing. Yeah, I use the word ruffians who would go around defacing things like they would, um, you know, paint stuff and they would um, they would break glasses and break uh break paintings all sorts of just really terribly disrespectful things and every time they did that they would write white face crew of 2002 and then they also got into a this is true <laughs> they also got into a routine of of uh pretty regularly um twice or three times a week um defecating in the stairways and the elevator of Whiteface Hall, and they would do it, and then they would write Whiteface Crew of 2002. I'm not joking. So finally, when they put a camera in the elevator, uh, which was a big deal, uh, they got caught, and then were able to be charged with every single bit that was uh, destroyed. So this is kind of that whole Darwinism, wouldn't you think? Mm -hmm. Like, are these like just because these students were there? doesn't necessarily mean they belong there because i mean come on yeah. i guess i wouldn't call it common sense but karma instant karma at least right get what you pay for so on that note though housing thrown thrown into that that idea of housing and and what that is what are what are some of the biggest common causes of stress as a student 
work. Work. Um, tests. You work? <laughs> you go to school full time and you work? Oh, uh, no, I actually don't work. I, I meant to say like homework. Oh, school and, work. Like Got school it. Okay. work and cool. stuff. Yeah, I work at home. Uh, it would be way too much for me to balance it right. here. Whenever I get home during my breaks and stuff, I'll work so then I have money for the semester but um, and to pay off loans. But s- schoolwork is definitely um, just also just like uh, – like home stuff like if anything is going on at home and then you're at school and you're you hear stuff at home it it definitely could throw off like your sleeping routines your patterns your studying patterns yeah uh like motivate your motivation could slip up in times like that and just like uh just like stay honestly the biggest stress is just staying making sure like not letting like little things bother you and just kind of just uh just doing the right things for yourself every day so you stay mentally healthy. Right. right. So that's a lot of work. So that can lead to a bit of stress, correct? Mm-hmm. What about you, Mac? What stresses you out? I would say that since I am going to be in school for a really long time, actually finishing school and being able to because of my financial situation would be a big factor. Um, okay, so, you wor- so worry. Yes. And okay. also I would say another huge factor would be social stress, just constantly having to interact with people and... If you're someone like me who has a lot of social anxiety, then you kind of are thinking constantly, like, what is this person thinking as they're looking at me? You're constantly yeah. passing people. And, like, if someone gives you a dirty look, I kind of internalize that. So I know I'm not the only one who experiences a lot of social anxiety on a college campus. You and I are a lot alike, Mac. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you. Um, wow, social social anxiety is a huge thing. So, I mean, do you ever get those times where... You're prepared, you're fully prepared to go to class, you walk to class, you get to the door, and then you're like, you either stop and turn around and go home, or you stop and you hesitate, and you actually consider not going into that class because of the social cues and social needs of of being in class. That happened to me so many times. But because I compensated, though, often by trying to get to know my teachers, so that if I did miss a class, I could just go see my teachers as much as possible. And I had a very positive experience, except for the, you know, the white face crew of 2002 situation. I had a very positive experience going to Plattsburgh State. Um, I proposed to my wife on stage. So, you know, there was, there was a lot, I have a lot of uh, positive um, connections, but, but I was definitely very stressed out. I wasn't living here, so I was commuting. Um, after after my brief stay in the in the dorms, I, I I finished out two more years of college from commuting, and that that was very stressful to me. So um, some so here are some stats. These are from the um, American Health Association, which actually do do regular um, uh, surveys. This is from a, t- a survey survey that was conducted in 2011, but is the most conclusive one, and they were saying that. For students, the the biggest source of stress, uh, uh, they started with relationship problems, you know, so boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, even families situation, family dynamic. That was about 9.1%. Work was 13%, so that's work outside of school. Sickness and cold or flu, 14.6%, which doesn't seem like that big, but that's a lot of kids missing school because they're sick, Right vaccinate please um depression was just a couple steps ahead of that and that's that's 15.9 but we all know with the whole depression concept that these are the people who identified that it was depression a lot of people don't identify depression because there's a stigma attached to that uh anxiety a whopping 24.2 percent that's pretty amazing i think and stress 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 just being stressed out in unnameable situations, these were leads to students having negative experiences at college. Now, do you see any of this in your day-to-day life? I mean, this was 2011. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say both of you were probably still in high school in 2011, right? So going into college, do you feel that this is any different? Has it gotten any better? Do you think major stressors are still anxiety, depression, kids getting sick for no real reason? I think that those things are still really prevalent. I don't go a day, I think, without hearing another student vent about these problems or me um, kind of confiding in that in a friend in those situations as well. So I definitely would agree that those are 
things you see in your day-to-day life at school. Yeah. So, um, so let me ask you, I'm going to throw this out, but I'm going to preface it right now. Please don't answer if you don't want to identify yourself. Please don't. But have you ever considered or sought out help from the, um, the health center for depression or anxiety? Now, I'm going to state, though, this is, I will say, is a huge under underutilized resource on campus. Um, but I do believe, and I worked, I work with some folks here uh, on the campus in SUNY Plattsburgh, and I think some of the attempts that they've made to connect with students are, you know, wonderful. But stigma, right? The stigma behind getting help and being vulnerable it's it's still there that's i think that's a major massive problem right do you feel like if it was if you weren't risking any sort of social uh taboo do you think going down to the health center and and seeing a counselor and talking to them would be a lot easier i feel like uh just like being in a fraternity and some of my friends some of them don't go to the uh, counseling and stuff. And also just friends back at home, even high school, like that just wouldn't seek help, th- help through the school. Or even if they're at home, like telling their parents to seek help out of school. And like a lot of them don't do that because they actually use their social as their help. So in this, when, I'm, when I say that, I mean in the sense that they will actually just rely on talking to their friends about how they're feeling. And that's like how they will cope with their whatever they're going through and that's right. how they like get past their stuff and they'd rather do that actually than go to counseling or right. go to s- seek help right um so some smaller schools have actually made uh, attempts to uh, bridge that gap a little bit by making it mandatory for students to see a counselor regularly and i i don't know how i feel about that like i kind of feel like yeah, that's a great part of me is like, oh, that's a great effort because, you know, it's it's cool when you can say, oh, I'm going to go see my counselor. Then, you know, behind closed doors, you're like, thank you. I get to see my counselor. You know, you get to kind of save face, which actually is very important in, in a social situation. Stigma exists for a certain reason. And you, you can't take on always. You can't be the person who changes everything. But um but Mac, you're going into the helping people field. Do you feel like stigma is going to still be an issue when you're graduated and working in the field? I think it probably will remain an issue. And for me, it is an issue necessarily. Um, I, there have been times where I feel like I should have gone to the health center just because I was overwhelmed and I needed help. And like what Jordan said, I do often confide in my friends or my mom, but I think it's really important to see a professional for certain situations because... Absolutely. There are things that, although your friends want to be there for you, if it's something that's a deeper or more serious issue, you need to talk to someone who knows what they're doing. Right. Peer support is is a wonderful thing, and it can help a lot of people. But the problem when you are confiding and going to your friends and family as support, um, it can actually be a double-edged sword because if someone cares for you, they don't want you to suffer, so they'll often allow you to cope in unhealthy ways right so you know friends are how many times have you gone to uh, confide in a friend and they're like D- you just need to get drunk let's go drink you know let's go do this let's it's it's a catharsis and maybe you will work out maybe things will get better but it also can lead you to some pretty uh, nasty habits correct what would you think Aaron absolutely um, I think that one of the issues facing a lot of college students is the underfunding issues that go on with health centers on campuses, mm-hmm. the lack of available mental health professionals to talk to folks, and not just the existence of them on a campus, but the quality of them and the understanding. They need professional development as much as any other professional on campus. And mm-hmm. so I think that you need to have an appropriate number, and I don't necessarily think that one for every thousand students is an appropriate number. Right. Um, I think you need substantially more than that. I think that... But do you think that has anything to do with the fact that these services are underutilized? It depends on the institution. Okay. Um, I know that at SUNY Plattsburgh, it can sometimes be difficult for our students to get the assistance that they need on campus because more and more of our students are moving past the stigma and seeking out the assistance that they actually need, which I think is a spectacular thing. Right. Um, that being said, it's essential that 
we have folks there to aid them and provide the services that they're seeking. Right. And not just provide the services that they're seeking, but provide these services in a timely fashion. Right. Now, please don't misunderstand this, Nick, anyone else here, anybody listening. I'm not trying to negatively critique the folks that we have on my campus. No, so no, no, no. That no. is not my goal I don't here. think that's apparent. Fabulous. Um, I Instead, I'm trying to suggest that it's important that not only we be able to move past our stigma, but that the folks who control the power of the purse, if you will, actually invest in these things to make sure that we are able to provide the necessary services. Right. So would, uh, let me ask the three of you, would you on campus, if you had an opportunity to in an afternoon, you know, maybe four or five hour training, take peer support training so that you can help support your, your, your student, would, student peers, would, is that something that you would do if it was provided on campus? For sure, definitely. I would love to partake in that and learn from it and literally be able to help. Helping someone is like the best feeling ever, I feel like, just like reaching out and stuff. Um, oh, a quick uh, just background. This summer I worked in, um, I worked at, um, I worked with the elderly okay. and uh, I would I would just help them out all the time. Uh, I would, uh, yeah. It's fine. Just take a second. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So I just worked and like with the elderly and I just really enjoyed it. I just loved like ha- being able to help them out. One of my, um, friends, grandmas were, uh, lived in the assisted home that I was working with. And, uh, I just, I like, got to put a smile on her face every day and like put smiles on their face and just like help them like with little things. And I just think like, even like, like that's a, that's just like like a different situation because it's the elderly, but like even with peers, like just like your friends and just knowing yeah. like really what's best for them in all the situations and knowing like going through that course, you would really realize like if someone needed uh, help beyond the peer, sure. uh, the peer helper, then you would be able to send them and point them into the right direction. So. Yeah, there you go. And you know, in a global concept, the elderly are our peers as well, right? So um, what do you think, Mac? Would you take a training that would provide peer support or at least give you some skills to provide peer support to others? I 100% would be interested in that kind of training, not only because it will help with my what I want to do with psychology, but also because I know I would probably feel more comfortable talking to a peer about certain issues. Yeah. Um, not only do they understand it in the context of how college is today, not just how some mental health professionals experience college in their time. So I think that it would be able to give me that kind of sense of a friendship and also understanding of someone my own age because I think that for our age group the college experience is very unique and a lot of things are emerging that are very different right I mean you know it's very it's very tough but what do you what do you say and and this is not a trick question I'm just throwing it out there oh so what do you say what do you say if someone comes up to you and says hey I'm, I'm having suicidal thoughts how do you help them the first wait wait do you get nervous nah yeah. Nah. I, mean, I I wouldn't get nervous. Okay. I would get like I would just feel for I would feel for the person and try to like I would th- I would take it as it's an emergency. I, w- I would take it just cuz I feel like if I got nervous then I wouldn't be able to help. So I feel like sure. I wouldn't have to be I so couldn't get So you'd be nervous. fighting your feelings to try to stay strong for your individual that is approaching you. And I'll, but if there was a training on campus that told you, hey, if somebody came up to you, these are the things that you can say to them and these are the resources that are available to them, would you take that? Would you take that training? Yes. So that's a good thing, 100%. right? And you know what? Uh, it sounds like, Mac, like you were going to say, yes, you would be nervous about something like that. Um. Yes. So I've had a lot of experience dealing with people who actually have had those kinds of experiences, those suicidal experiences. And I'm not a trained professional at all, but I do know that when someone comes to you with those kinds of thoughts or those feelings, it is very much an emergency and that you should always take that seriously. And I think also that a lot of people joke about mental health nowadays and you see it on the internet in memes sure. it's like oh i'm going to kill myself i i failed a test and like right. i think that that's really counterproductive for mental health awareness because yeah. it's not necessarily falsifying those feelings because you never know if someone's really feeling them or not sure. but i think 
it's really important to take those kinds of things seriously. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, it's, this is good information. So if we have listeners out there that can facilitate these trainings, just know that there are students who are available. Yeah, I could facilitate these trainings, but hey, <laughs> I got, it's not, it's not as easy. I could also just go up on campus, stand up on a soapbox. And then, you know, of course, five minutes later, I'm going to start getting kicked out. But, um, so let's, let's, let's transition a little bit. Uh, I have some important information for you. Have you heard of the term alumni, right? What do you think alumni means? People who have graduated and were a part of the community. Right. So it's Latin. It's a, it's a Latin word. Alumni actually um, translates into Latin from alumnus, which means foster son. Interesting, right? Um, and how about alma mater? You know what that means? Right? It comes from the Latin uh, term meaning nurturing mother. So when you say, so this, this concept that you're going to school, we, we, we carry that parental concept, that these are, these are parental units that are going to nurture us into being adults, right? So that's, a, that's a strange thing because I think stuff like that's forgotten quite a bit, right? Because I think sometimes schools concentrate on the business model. Right, getting more students, get more students, get more students, but that also might be why the dropout rate's so high, right? So I got a couple more questions for you. Uh, one, so you're going to school, you're gonna have, a, you're gonna graduate eventually, hopefully, right? Um, will it be worth it? I sure as hell hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer, Aaron. Is it worth it? You graduated. You've graduated, graduated a couple times, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so was it worth it? Holistically, yes. Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, it may not necessarily feel that way during the process, of course, because again, all of the stressors that you mentioned earlier right. in the podcast. But absolutely, I think that the lessons that I learned from this institution were key in turning me into the person that I am. Right. And so, Mac, you are uh, getting your undergraduate right now, correct? And then you're going to go for your master's and then your doctorate. Yes. <laughs> so after all this time, do you believe that this will be worth it? I think it really will be worth it. Um, I do love being in the college environment. There are a lot of stressors that go along with that, but this is 100% where I want to be. I think this is the environment that I can really um, do my best in. And I also think that just the year and a half that I've been in school, I've developed and learned a lot about myself as a person as well as academically, so I think it'll be worth it. Mm, cool, cool, cool. So I've got some I've got some small facts that I was that I discovered while I was looking all this stuff up. Um, so uh, according to Wikipedia, which isn't as uh, corrupt as it used to be, but it's, it's got some good corrupt. statistical and but it's got statistical information that's pretty fascinating. So Wikipedia, when they were cataloging all of the American colleges, they were able to to find that there are sixty female only co colleges in America and only four all male colleges in America. What do you think about that? Pretty interesting, right? I mean, it's a loaded it's a kind of a loaded question cuz cuz like <laughs> we we kind of talk about sexism, you know, when when women talk about women female empowerment, that's that's a great that's a great thing, uh, but when men talk about male empowerment, it's like shut up, dude, you know, right? So there's only four schools, there are only four colleges that are accredited that are just for men, and there are 60 that are accredited that are just for women. What do you think about that? I'm, 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 I'm dying to hear what your input is. I'm curious to know if out of those 60 women's colleges, if there's any people who are representative of the transgender population. It's a good question. Or those not. are stats. Those are stats that I, so I was trying to find stats on that. There are stats that are hard to find about trans students. And there are there is definitely evidence out there to state that a lot of schools suppress the population of trans just so that they can fit people in certain statistical data. That's very alarming to me. But it's interesting. Yeah. So for the majority, from when I, I'm just trying to look, though, a lot of the women's colleges were actually very uh, religious. So they were often Catholic, some sort of Catholic interesting thing. So yeah. so what do you think? I mean, 
Um, do you think there should be more male colleges? Do you think we should just abolish the whole all for men, all for women thing? Just have it all to be everybody, every college to be co-ed? I definitely don't think every college should be co-ed because I think people have their reasons as to why they do not choose a co-ed school. But I was actually interested. I was thinking um, if like possibly just with the military, I was wondering if there's certain schools that actually split up women and men and men. Ooh. But I was just hmm. curious as to that. But, um, you know, I don't really know. I know with the military, that'd be a little different because there has been a, a lot more push to equalize treatment of women and men in mm-hmm. the military. But but you might be on to something on that end. I think that. Before we start focusing on that, we really need to focus more on us as a society on treating women, trans folk, and gender nonconforming folk as the human beings that they are. Yeah, that's true. Um, because we spend far too much time trying to infantilize and strip them of their humanity. So I think a pretty solid move would be for all educational institutions to start focusing more on that sort of... Yeah. Well, you know, I just I just kind of found like that was an interesting fact and statistic, and there there aren't a, there aren't a lot of schools that say that they are just white and not ju- you know or all white all black, but we all know that there are schools that are predominantly white, right? So it's interesting. It's just something to kind of throw out there. Uh, Plattsburgh State is pretty diverse. Would you say? I mean, there's there's definitely uh, some folks that are very. Um, marginalized as far as representation here at Plattsburgh State, but I can say it's better than it was when I graduated in 2004. And that percentage is only going to go up of the incoming first-year student class. About 40% of the students identify as non-white. Yeah. 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 So, and also to add with when I was looking for the trans data, I found that enrollment-wise, every year, almost 60% of college enrollment are female. Which is interesting, right? So, so I got one more question to ask you. Just kind of throwing out all this knowledge. Uh, this one more question is along the lines of you're you've been all of you have been at the university for a little while, correct? What needs to change? What needs to change? What needs to change for the future? Because school enrollment is going down every year. College, kids are not going to college as often as they were. Uh, dropout, the dropout rate is higher. Uh, schools are more expensive than they've ever been. The job pool is very hard to promise jobs after, after you've graduated. So the incentive is, is slowly going away. So what could change to make college more survival based you know actually getting through surviving college what needs to change i think that the financial aspect of it is really something that affects if not everyone a lot of people so for people whose families can't contribute literally any money to their education they're still taking on thousands and thousands of debt and also still have to pay out of pocket whether that be the student working a full-time job or the parents really scraping pennies out of what they already don't have to try to at least give some money to the education so that way the financial aid can cover the rest. But I think that, especially in New York State, the financial aid system really needs a lot of um, reconstruction Mm -hmm. and it needs to be evaluated a lot. And I think that the Excelsior Scholarship, which came out, which is supposed to help students cover the rest of their tuition, it actually only applies to the actual tuition. So room and board is not um, accounted for within that. So I know for me personally, my tuition was already paid with financial aid, but I had a leftover amount that was room and board. And if the Excelsior Scholarship, which was something that was implemented to help students, isn't going to cover that, it's just another hole in the system, I think. Right, so it's almost like actually encouraging students to not stay on campus, to find alternative housing, and probably also not take care of their nutritional needs as well, right? That's uh, a... that's good input. Thank you, Mac. Definitely. I think that's a great point. And I think that that accredits to a lot of people, literally what you said, a lot of people living off campus because it's a cheap, cheaper alter- alternative. But that still messes like 
that messes up a lot because there is a lot of people that actually would rather live on campus than off campus for study reasons and focus reasons because right. obviously when you're off campus it's easier to not be focused when you're living in a house that is the, that isn't like that you're not on campus and living in the dorms and have RAs and have study hours and it's your own your own room your own free time out of campus so i feel like a lot of people would live on campus if it if it if the financial aid system was reconstructed and if uh the room and board was cheaper because i actually am in the same exact situation my tuition is paid for i get financial aid for that but what's killing me is literally room and board it's all these fees all these fees yep. and it's 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 room and board is like the most expense it's more expensive than the tuition so like it's yeah it's a killer there there were some colleges that when i was trying to find research where um there were some students who weren't uh buying parking passes because it was cheaper for them to pay the parking tickets than it was to purchase the parking pass and that that's just astounding to me right but but thank you for being here and you know when i said that i had one last question that was a lie so here's my one last question right finally right now how are you surviving how are you surviving? How are you still here? What's well, why are you still here? How are you still here? Aaron, I'm going to start with you because you have transitioned from student to administrator of some sorts and facilitator of some sorts, but you're still college is a huge part of your life. How are you surviving? Strong support networks, um, both in my position and socially and in terms of familial bonds, both biological and beyond. You really need to have a strong support system that keeps up with you and helps maintain everything in your life. Okay. Because if you don't have that, you're not going to be successful. All right. All right. Okay. So strong support systems. What else? I would say the people around me. Okay. Um, I definitely, I met some people that had have had huge impacts on my life through first semester. I definitely think my first, my, my starting at my freshman year of college, that definitely shaped a lot of why I pushed forward and stayed at college because I met the right people that helped me in times. And also I've met great professors that have taught me so much and that influenced me and teach me things. I learned something new every single day. And I just, I, I definitely think that that is shaping why I'm surviving and why I am continuing to jo enjoy the experience. All right. Mac, you have any input? Uh, this sounds a bit cheesy, but my mom is actually the reason I'm still in college. Um, my mom has just like always been the person who is very selfless and always put me and my sister first. And I'm the first in my family to go to college, so I really just want to make her proud and be able to give her socioeconomic stability that she's never had in her life. So honestly, a lot of what I do is really for my mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> so, so would you say that uh, your, your inspiration is almost you stress? This, the, the idea that you've got this thing that you have to do and it's motivating you. Absolutely. It's, okay, that's really great. Well, thank you for being here and uh, take care of yourselves and take care of each other's. And, and, and it's just so wonderful to be able to actually speak to people who are yet to graduate from the school that I happen to love. So SUNY Plattsburgh. Um, so if you have any questions, if any of the listener, listeners have any questions or would like to forward any comments to our guests today, please feel free to send a message to this uh, to North Volume by going to northvolume.com, listening to the podcast. You can comment right there. You can also go to the Mental Health Survival Guide Facebook page and comment on the show or send us a message and I will make sure your, your, your comments and your messages get to these students and maybe we'll have you guys back and we'll talk more about surviving college. What would, yeah? Yay? Yeah, okay. I'd love that. Okay, great. Okay, well, so take care of yourselves and take care of each other because we all know that survival is so much more than just staying alive. This has been a North Volume Network podcast, the only podcast network in the North Country. Check out our full lineup on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or northvolume.com.